Hello and welcome to PWGL tutorial number four. Today we're going to go a little bit farther in our investigation of the ENP score notation format. My hope is that by understanding how the scores are formatted, it will help you later when you're trying to algorithmically generate your own scores in PWGL. That's my hope. So last time we built a new little score and we showed how one can add um, note events and rests and subdivide a beat and even do nested tuplets. Today I want to hit some of the other things that I mentioned in that um, video but didn't quite get to. But before we launch into um, investigating more about the PWGL score format, I just want to make sure you know that there are help resources up here which are pretty substantial in uh, PWGL. There's PWGL help, which has a um, lot of information and many, many tutorials that are actual PWGL patches that you can explore and play with. Um, there are uh, tutorials associated with many of the libraries. If you've installed any external libraries, they often have their own tutorials. And um, uh, there are there's a tutorial out there on all of the sort of basic kernel uh, PWGL items um, that's available too, um, which is very useful. You should look into acquiring that. I think it's all links to most of these, if not all of them, are available from the PWGL website. But also, if you go under ENP help, because we're talking more about ENP today, similarly, there's an introduction, um, there's actually a PDF manual, and um, the text of several publications about the uh, the ENP score notation format, et cetera, et cetera. So these are worth looking at, and several ENP tutorials, as well as um, some reference materials, which I think duplicate what's in this PDF, uh, but they're sort of live navigable here in the um, software itself. Uh, for instance, here's Appendix A score notation keywords. So if you wanted to know, well, what are the keywords I could add, say, at the measure level, um, in my scores that I'm creating, what are they? Here they are right there. So this is definitely something that could be valuable. We may refer to this a little bit later in this video. I'm not sure. All right. So what I want to do today is um, go through pretty quickly this time some of the other notational um, attributes that one might want to program into your PWGL scores. So what I'm going to do now is go up here to uh, a patch which I've sort of pre-baked. Uh, so we can go faster, uh, which I've called um, adding details to a score. So we're going to start here with simple example. Okay, and that is the one which is rendered here at the bottom. I select the score editor object and hit V to evaluate. And yes, there we go. Quarter note equals 60, 3, 4, and 3 quarter notes. Remember, whenever you connect your score text to a score editor, it must go through the ENP constructor object first. The ENP constructor object takes the score notation format, which is basically a text file, and actually instantiates the software object, which is an ENP score. You must do this step in order to see your score. So it's often the case that beginners get so excited about their scores that they connect them directly to a score editor and are disappointed that it gives error messages. So remember to include the ENP constructor object in there. All right, so let's just look at this first score. This is a review. Um, remember that the score level parentheses are added when one evaluates the text box. It always takes whatever's inside and wraps it in parentheses. So that's the score level um, list. Then we have part level, voice level, measure level. And then here is a beat, which contains a sub beat, which is one, 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 one. Um, so each of these now would easily be, uh, could be changed uh, by adding a pitch to it, um, which we did um, last time, uh, so I won't do that now just for the sake of time. All right, so that's simple example one. All right, in the second example, now notice I'm going to take the output of the second example score and take it now to the ENP constructor object. Uh, it says super, add a superfluous tuplet. This is basically just to remind you how to create tuplets. I'll evaluate it first, and there we go. We have two eighth notes, a triplet, and two eighth notes again. Let's look at the structure of the score. I basically just elaborated what we had before. Now on our beat level, the first beat of this 3-4 measure has two ones, two equally spaced events in here, and that gives us two eighth notes at the pitch uh, middle C. 
Remember that if you do not specify a pitch, um, it will just default to the pitch middle C. So all of these are the default pitch. I'm not specifying pitch yet in this score. And the second beat, here we have uh, one beat, one beat, one beat. So the first beat is divided into two tuplets. The second beat is three tuplets. And the third beat is two tuplets. So two eighth notes, three triplets, two eighth notes. If suppose I wanted to take this first one and turn it into 16th notes, I could just add two more ones here. And when I evaluate, I now have 16th notes in that first measure. So this might be obvious, but if I would say add one more and have five ones there, and evaluate. Now I have quintuplets. If I would take one of these and change it from, uh, let's take two of them and change them from ones to twos, I now have one plus two, which is three, plus one is four, plus two is six, plus one is seven, and therefore when I evaluate, I get a septuplet there with unequally um, spaced divisions. Okay, so I'm going kind of fast this time, but I think you can stop and review um, if you want to, uh, and I, I think we've covered this ground pretty much. All right, so let's go on then. Let's try to add our instrument name and a specific clef for that instrument. I'm going to now connect this score to the ENP constructor object and look inside. All right, so now I've simplified it again. Um, uh, I've gone down to the very simple rhythms again, just the uh, eighth notes. But at the part level, I can specify an instrument for this part in my score. Colon instrument, space, quote, name of your instrument, close quote, and I'm also uh, designating a particular staff for this instrument, colon, staff, space, and I say tenor dash staff. You might wonder, where can I find the list of all the possible instruments and all the possible uh, clefts that I could use? And this is where we would go back to those help files that we saw earlier. Okay, so I'm going to go to um, reference, um, let's see, Score notation keywords we saw earlier. Appendix 2 is the, all the colors possible. Uh, appendix 3 is all the keys that you, one may specify. Uh, here are all the instruments. So uh, Appendix D of the reference. And as you can see, there are many, many instruments. Woodblock, Vibra Slap, Glockenspiel, Tubular Bells. All of these, PWGL knows that they are specific instruments that one may specify. Um, and it knows something about what they are, which is interesting. We'll get into that later. And let's see, Appendix 5 are expressions. We'll get back to that later. Appendix 6, expression attributes. Appendix 7, uh, macros, which we will not get into. And graphical tools. Okay, so I was looking for the clefts, which I know is, um, those are indeed in the reference itself somewhere. Um, accidentals, blah, blah, blah. Under staff, I believe. It's a lot here. Staff. Okay, so treble, alto, tenor, bass, percussion, multi percussion, organ. These are the staffs that one may specify. Okay? All right, so going back to this little score here, let's evaluate. Hit V to evaluate. All right, so now what has changed? It now knows that this is bassoon one, it has uh, added the tenor staff and it has uh, given us four eighth notes again, but look at this, we also have a tempo change, uh, tempo equals 96. All right, so if we go back in here, where did that happen? Aha! So on the part level, one specifies instrument name and clef, and then on the measure level, one can specify metronome value. So every single measure can have its own metronome value. And you actually can do accelerandos and uh, etc., um, but we will not go into that today. All right, and also, what is this low for? This actually is, you can specify the denominator of your time signature. So 4 is 4, 3, 4. If I would change this to 8 and reevaluate this, now it's a 3, 8 measure. It has taken all of that rhythmic information which I gave and it has now recontextualized it uh, with the eighth note as the primary pulse. So that's pretty cool. You can very quickly um, specify your meter there. Now you might wonder where is that three in the three eight coming from? That is because my measure has three beats. So whatever um, number of beats is present in the measure, that is what the numerator of your 
time signature is uh, by default. So we control the denominator, PWGL just does the math, and whatever is there, that is the numerator of your time signature. There are ways that you can create, um, like uh, say, 2.8 plus 3.8 and things like that. We will not go into that today, but it is possible. All right, so um, let's go to our next score, and now we're adding pitches. We did this in the last video, so I don't know uh, how much we have to specify, but let's play it. Okay, it's kind of a cute little tune there. Uh, so again, we have our bassoon, tenor staff, low 4, metronome value, 96. And now, let's actually unpack one of these pretty quickly. Um, so we have our three beats. Here's beat number one, beat number two, beat number three. All right, as an example, let's just take beat number one. I'll make some space here, and let's look at what's going on inside beat number one here. Well, if we look inside beat number one, we have one note with a pitch of 69 and another note with a pitch of 72. And I can click here and see that indeed um, we have uh, a parenthesis level which says this is the list of all the notes in this beat. And then each individual note has its own parenthesis level which says, okay, this is one and inside it is this pitch. Here's another one right here and inside it is this pitch, okay? I could sort of arbitrarily add another pitch here um, and now, all right, um, or I could take that away and I could say, actually, I want this to be three and that to be one. Um, so it's just going to uh, reimagine uh, the, it's reimagining the um, rhythmic balance between the two based on those notes and again, uh, those values. And again, we did this last time, so this is kind of a review. But I think it's worthwhile to do a little bit of reviewing as we go, since we're going kind of quickly. Now, we're going to add some grace notes. This is cool. Um, so PWGL understands the difference between um, normal notes and grace notes. So let's see how we specify grace notes here. Oh, and this one I made it very clean. I did all my indenting properly. So this looks a little bit nicer. All right, so here is our part. Here is our voice. Here is our measure. So remember the metronome value goes in the measure. You don't have to specify low. If you do not specify, it defaults to four as the denominator of the meter. And you do not have to specify metronome value. That defaults to 60. All right, here's our first beat. Inside of this beat, we have two notes. This is exactly what we had before, but just space more nicely. First note has a pitch of 69. Second note has a pitch of 72. All right, let's go now to the second beat. Look at this. Um, if you look now, we have one, two, three, four beats in our three, four measure. Okay, so what's going on here? The second one has this added instruction, class, grace beat. So we've inserted an extra beat into our measure, uh, which has uh, two notes. The first one is 71, the second one is 72. But after the description of the list of notes in this beat, so at the level of the beat itself, after the list of beats, we add colon class, which is saying this is a particular class of beat. And then we have colon grace dash beat, saying this is a grace beat. And that's fantastic because it does not alter our meter, but it allows us to insert grace notes. Okay, so let's just um, look below at the last beat of this measure. Here we have, um, we had two eighth notes in here, but now we have three notes. We have one, two, which is a grace beat, and three, which is the one which was there before. Okay, and if we look at this second beat here in the measure, we can see that it has a list of notes, which of course is just one note, 67, and then after it, as above, it has colon class, colon grace beat, to indicate that this one beat in this beat, the subbeat here, is a grace beat in uh, the context of this beat. Okay, so let's evaluate it and see what we get. Okay, and there we go. Grace notes are in place. Now, if it wasn't already obvious, this tune should be somewhat familiar now, I think. Okay, so we're in the home stretch now. Let's see what else we might want to add to this little excerpt from the Rite of Spring. I'm going to open up the last score, which is another variation, and this one simply adds an expression 
to the existing notes, and that is a slur. So if you'll see here, beginning in our first um, note group here, the grace notes, we have added after the colon notes with the note uh, um, pitch, we have colon expressions, and then a parenthesis, colon slur slash one. So just as we have colon notes and then the note value is in parentheses, we have colon expressions and the expression value is also in parentheses. So slur is a type of expression and we can number them in case there are more than one uh, going on simultaneously. So we have slur and then slash one to indicate this is slur number one. And you simply add this expressions slur one under all the notes that you want the slur to occur in. So this slur happens in this beat and then in this beat. And then when we go down here, we see slur one, slur one again. So slur one continues from these grace notes into um, these um, eighth notes of the second beat of the measure. And then down here in the third beat of the measure, we again have another slur. This one is slur two. Similarly, colon expressions, parenthesis, slur, slash two. And that continues uh, through to the last note of the measure. Okay, so let's evaluate. And there we go. Doesn't sound different, but clearly we have added visual information, which is musically relevant. And this is now taking us on our way to uh, get this score um, in a readable format for a musician. And uh, maybe in the next um, session, we will talk a little bit about how to export this form, uh, the score to a program like uh, Finale or Sibelius. So now as our last little feat, let's just try to add another kind of score expression. And in this case, we will choose a dynamic. So I'll say here is our first note, and I will add an expression a dynamic level to that first note. So I'm going to have colon expressions and then colon F for forte. And we go down and evaluate. There it is. It's that simple. Pretty amazing, huh? All right, so that does it for today's session, and we will continue with more in the next video. Thank you. Oh, just a quick addendum here. I was uh, constructing this right of spring measure on purposely because there is a paper that uh, the authors of PWGL created on the expressive notation package. It was published in the Computer Music Journal in 2006. And in this article, um, they actually use this measure as a demonstration of, or at least two measures, including the measure I just did, as a demonstration of the ENP score structure. So you may want to check out this um, paper from the 2006 Computer Music Journal, uh, which will show you um, uh, and walk through sort of how these measures are put together. Um, so it's definitely worth checking out.